Well, good morning. What an awesome, incredible, exciting morning for us to gather together to know, uh, isn't this an incredible truth that, that Jesus inhabits the praises of his people and that childlike faith and childlike praise is what he desires from us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, as we continue our walk through the book of Acts this fall. I want to share with you uh, a couple recent uh, stories from the persecuted church uh, around the globe. Uh, these, these stories are ongoing. They happen all the time. Uh, in Iran, just last month, six Christians were arrested and sentenced to 10 years in jail each, away from their families for simply attending a house church. In northern India, 20 pastors have been arrested and falsely tried this month. And in Nigeria, uh, a few months ago, a young college student was stoned to death for posting on her message board, Praise Jesus, he helped me with my exams. As we see this morning in Acts chapter 4, it is going to be the beginning of persecution for the early church, as they are going to be called before the Sanhedrin and put on trial and threatened. And we're going to see the way that they responded. Will you... Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we, we pray that you would give us courage and boldness, that you would allow us to see what you are doing around us, the way that you are working, constantly working, that your plans are unfolding for, for our lives and for the kingdom to go forward. And Father, that when we see that, we pray that you would grant us courage and boldness to be your witnesses, to proclaim the truth of who you are and all that you're doing in everything that we do. Father, that you would show us opportunities that we have in our freedom in this free culture, day in and day out, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, over a cup of coffee or over lunch or uh, simple times of get together, Father, that we might be a witness for you, King Jesus, to allow you to work through us to draw men and women to yourself for eternal salvation, for the glory of your name. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. So to recap what, what had happened a couple weeks ago when we were in Acts chapter three, okay? So for weeks after Pentecost, Okay? The apostles have been daily going to the temple for morning prayer, and they would, they would meet together because it was a large enough open space for them to begin uh, to meet with other believers. Imagine how exciting this is, that 3,000 were saved on that very first day. And yet at the same time, it's complex, because where does the church meet to disciple new believers in one another. And it's scary because the Roman and Jewish leaders stand in opposition. One morning, Peter and John are entering the temple for prayer. And as they're entering in, they come across a 40-year-old cripple who has been lame from birth, who daily sits at the temple and begs for alms. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter and gives him the ability to heal him. The man did not have faith in Jesus. All he was expecting was money. It is simply a miracle that God wanted to do, okay, in the most visible spot in all of Jerusalem to someone that everyone knew and would recognize. Well, with this guy 
running and jumping and praising God all through the temple courtyard. It wasn't long before a crowd gathered around. And it's at this moment that Peter stands up because he has the whole crowd's attention and he gives what we call his second sermon. He says, listen, this miracle was done in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. Repent and be cleansed from your sins. And the emphasis that Garrett looked at two weeks ago, and experience times of refreshment from God. Think about that. Verse 319, a call God is calling you to experience life and refreshment from him. Well, our story continues in chapter 4. So look at verse 4 of chapter 4. But many of, those who had, uh, many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of men, just men at this point, came to be about 5,000. Remember, after Pentecost, there were 3,000 total, men, women, and children. And, and chapter 2, verse 47, says that God was adding to their number daily. And now, after this miracle in the temple, where they had a full day of Peter and John preaching right there in the temple courtyard... We'll see here in a second that, that it says that they, uh, the, t the temple guard didn't capture them until evening, and that miracle happened in the morning. So they had an entire day of everyone seeing this guy. They're like, I recognize him. And you get to see thousands upon thousands come to faith, conversions all day. So to the end, when it says there's 5,000 men, you have to assume it's like, 15,000 total, right? If you just say 5,000 men and 5,000 women and 5,000 children, the church is exploding. Can you imagine the excitement of what it is to see thousands come to faith in Jesus Christ? Verses one and two. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly discouraged, discouraged or sorry, disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now in verse three, they're going to put them in jail because it's already evening time. And then the next day in verses 5 and 6, Peter and John are going to stand before the formal Sanhedrin, the court, gathered together. Now the Sanhedrin consists of prominent priests and laymen. Scribes and teachers of the law, this, was, this would include uh, your Pharisee scholars. By the way, the Pharisees, they had religious differences with Jesus. And so all through Jesus's ministry, they are persecuting Jesus. But the Sadducees, it's a different story. They, they are the third group that consists of, uh, of the Sanhedrin. And in fact, they are the prominent ruling authority of the Sanhedrin. They had the high priestly family. They had all the political power and authority. All right, when they get involved, heads start rolling. Early on in Jesus's ministry, they didn't care that much about him. He's small potatoes at this point. But the moment that they see he is starting to uh, cause an imbalance in political structure, watch out. All right, they would sell their mama to stay in power. They are the sophisticated, wealthy elite. Oddly enough, about the Sadducees, they, they don't really believe in much beyond materialism and their own power. They deny the supernatural. So, so they believe no healings can occur. There are no angels, no demons. And above all, there is no resurrection from the dead. To them, religion is simply ideals, which is fine because they have all the power, because that's all they really care about. 
Now, what I want us to see this morning is the way that they are the pinnacle of self-righteousness and pride. Man holding on to his world, his influence, the things that he control, and so certain, all right, that, that there is nothing else that they are willing to sell their own souls to clutch all that they hold dear. So that when God himself stands before him, before them, they crucify him. And when an undeniable miracle is right before their very eyes, they ask, what should we do with these men? So let's fill in the account. After spending the night in jail, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. They they are uh, meeting in their formal setting. So in your mind, imagine the magnitude of the scene. The entire high priestly family is there. The high priest is the one who gets to go inside the Holy of Holies, the only one once a year. The entire high priestly family is there. And in verse 7, they ask them, by what power or in what name have you done this? Verse 8, then Peter Filled with the Holy Spirit said to them. Guys, this is so good for two reasons, right? One, remember 60 days prior when Jesus was arrested and he is taken to Caiaphas' house and he stands before, Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin under a mock trial at night. What was Peter doing that night? Denying Jesus as he warms his hands by a charcoal fire. See, he's just surrounded by the servants of of the court. Just the servants. But, But because he's around such powerful, influential, and that entire scene, it causes him to deny Christ three times. But now, Standing before that very body, before them, he will say, in Jesus' name, this miracle was done, and you killed Jesus. How's that for boldness? Look at Peter now. And secondly, you remember in Luke 12, 11 and 12, Jesus told his disciples that moments like this were coming. But he had a promise for them, okay? When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. Right? And here, verse 8, it says the Holy Spirit filled Peter. And so they ask him, by what power or in what name? Right? They are hoping to intimidate Peter. Just like they had done to Jesus before. By what authority are you doing these things? And here is what the Spirit gave Peter to say. Here's a summary of verses 8 through 12. First of all, Peter says, listen, are we on trial for doing good to someone that was lame? I mean, this, guy, this guy's been sick. Are we on trial for doing something good? Well, all right, if that's the case, it, let it be known that it is in the name of Jesus that this healing occurred. Amen. Number two, that same Jesus, you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. Which, by the way, was predicted in Scripture, and then they quote Psalm 118 to them. But as he quotes, he inserts Jesus' name and them into it. Look at verse 11. He, that is Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you. That's not in the Scripture, but he's like, it was by you. The builders 
uh, which became the chief cornerstone. And then he ends it, he caps it all off, this short little statement, and there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And they are speechless. Because the only other person who has ever stood before them with this sort of presence and confidence was Jesus. Look at verse 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. What a magnificent statement, right? Oh, that that would be said of me, that I would be recognized as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing right with them, well, they had nothing to say in reply. Like, what can they say? And so the Sanhedrin's like, hey, can you guys exit? Can you go to the side real quick? We need to talk amongst ourselves. So they get Peter and John to exit. They look at each other dumbfounded, and they say, what should we do with these men? What should you do? What should you do? You saw signs and wonders from Jesus. You had verified reports from your own people that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. He stood before you, this very council, and you were amazed by his presence while you hurled all these accusations against him, and he sat there silently. In the end, the only accusation you could come up with is that he claimed to be the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God. And so you had him crucified on the Passover. And while he hung on the cross, darkness rolled in and covered up the noonday sun. Followed by a violent earthquake at the moment of his death, which tore the temple veil from top to bottom. And that night, the moon rose blood red in lunar eclipse. What should you do three days later at the festival of first fruits? The guards came trembling uh, from the grave and gave an account that the earth shook, an angel descended and rolled away the massive stone. By the way, you remembered that he said he would rise from the dead, and so you put those guards there and rolled that massive stone in front of the tomb. What should you do? The disciples for months have been proclaiming boldly that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now, right before your very eyes, a 40-year-old man who has been crippled from birth stands before you made whole, praising God, and all of it has been done in the name of Jesus. 15,000 believe, and Peter, an uneducated fisherman, stands before you and is, and is quoting Psalm 118 in your face. What should you do? Repent and believe. Become undone by your sin. Hear the words of eternal life. But they won't. Because in their heart they say, why would I ever need a savior? Do you remember when Jesus was met in the middle of the night by Nicodemus the Pharisee? In John 3.20, Jesus looks boldly at him and says, listen, for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. If you are here this morning and you have never been spiritually reborn, 
by placing your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, the thing that stands between you and eternal life is your pride and self-righteousness. That deep down, you fear that your heart would be truly exposed. And so you endlessly try and cover it up and compare yourself against other people, always stacking the deck so that you come out on top, so that you can say, see, I'm a good person. I'm just as good as that guy, and I'm certainly better than her. All right, I'm surely God is happy with me and would welcome me into heaven. You see, you think that there's security in numbers, but the Bible says broad is the road to destruction and narrow is the road to life, and few will find it. Listen to me, what if you're not compared to your neighbor or your lazy coworker? What if, as the Bible says, you are compared to the perfection of God himself? Well, then you would be dead in your sins. And what if your only hope is to trust what Jesus has accomplished for you, on your behalf, what you could never do for yourself, that is live a perfect life and that he died in your place. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, have you been saved? Have you been undone by your sins and fallen helplessly at the foot of the cross and cried out for mercy? Would you right now? Would you let go and cast all of your faith in Jesus Christ? You do not have to respond like the Jewish leaders in their pride and self-righteousness, controlling their tiny world. Where are they now? Can't you advise them from history looking back, saying, let go of whatever you think is so important in your life. Whatever it costs you, it is all in vain. One day, very soon, it will all be meaningless and you will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Will you accept Christ? Now, I want us to look back through this account, and I want us to walk through, and I want us to focus on the disciples' boldness and the way that they respond to the threats of first persecution. Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin. Remember? That same high court that sentenced Jesus to death. By what power or in what name have you done this? And Peter's like, in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, you killed him. After they meet privately, all they can come up with is, well, let's threaten them, okay? Let's tell them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. I mean, we can't deny this miracle. The guy's standing right next to them. We all recognize him. We can't, let's just threaten them and tell them to go away. So in verse 18, they call Peter and John back in. They say it in their most stern voice, do not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Peter and John are like, look, we're going to obey God, not you. We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. It's just like crickets. They're like, well, that did not go as well as we thought. What do we do next? All right, let's threaten them again, right? And and you know there's one guy who's who's like, his face is red. He's got a vein popping and his eyes are popping out of his. He's like, we are going to kill you if you don't stop. 
Peter and John are like, okay. I mean, you thought that they were mad before. They were like, we will never stop telling people about Jesus. So, there's thousands of people that are waiting outside who are rejoicing because they've just seen a miracle and they're like, I guess we gotta let them go. So they threaten them again and they let them go. Now I love the way that this ends because look at verses 23 through 31. Because they go back and they gather up the rest of the disciples, right? The core group. And they begin to retell everything that's happened in the threats. And so I imagine Peter going back and retelling the story. I imagine Peter's probably a really good storyteller. All right, so he's like, and then the Holy Spirit filled me, and I said, in the name of Jesus, whom you killed. And they're like, and what'd they say? Well, they threatened to kill us. But I said, we will never stop telling the name of Jesus. And you just thought they were mad before. I mean, they were really mad now. They said, I mean, their eyes are bulging out their head. They said they're going to kill us and we better watch it. But they couldn't because there was a crowd outside that was, that was protecting us and they, they released us. And the crowd's like, um, what stops them from just coming now? And understandably, Right? In, that, in that core group of the early disciples, a fear runs through them. And they begin to be shaken because they're looking at everything from the earthly perspective, right? It's scary. This is the same group that just had Jesus crucified. So what do they do? They read Psalm 2. Psalm 2 talks about the kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his Messiah. But he who sits in heaven laughs. He who sits in heaven laughs. And they remember afresh, even in their fear. Hey, wait a second. Nothing happens to us that doesn't go through God first. God is in control. God is in control. And then corporately, they gather together, right? They're gathered. They pray corporately together, Psalm 2, back to God. See verse 25? They're quoting God's word back to him. God, you said in your word this. And they lift their voices in one accord. And then look at their prayer in verse 29. They say, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Look, there's three things there real quickly. They say, God, take note of their threats. All right? This is a cry of faith because they've just read Psalm 2. They're like, God, you're on your throne. Your Messiah's on the throne. But from my perspective, it's scary. God, take note of their threats. They are taking a step of faith. They're saying, God, I believe your word, but help my unbelief. You see that? God, take note of your threats. They're trying to to, uh, enact Psalm 2 right there. And then listen to this petition. Grant us confidence to keep speaking your word. God, would you give us courage? Would you give us boldness? And then thirdly, God, would you keep moving with signs and wonders to show everyone that you are with us, that you meet with us, that we are your people, 
and so that they can join us, so that others can come to know. Now look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, Peter and John, they were filled with the Holy Spirit when they were standing before the Sanhedrin. But now after they go back and they tell everyone of the threats, they needed to corporately pray together, but then the Holy Spirit fell and encouraged all of them, filled them with boldness. Because when the Holy Spirit is present, there is power. Because he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-discipline. And yes, they were already filled with the Holy Spirit, but they needed a refilling for the moment to keep abiding and to face their current circumstances. Just like you and I need a continual refilling of the Holy Spirit to face each and every new day. But think about where this is going. Because a group of lower class, uneducated disciples with absolutely no political power are about to stand before kings and governors and courts and even Caesar himself, the most powerful man on the planet and fearlessly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And they will face intense persecution. Their homes will be burned. They'll lose their jobs. They'll have difficulty feeding their families. They will even be fed to the lions. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. Beloved, this is our heritage. All through church history, to this day, where our brothers and sisters around the world continue to face persecution, intense persecution, and stand up with boldness in the name of Jesus Christ. There was a Newsweek article that did an extensive study uh, from 2015 to 2017, and concluded that persecution and genocide of Christians across the world is worse today than it's ever been in all of human history. Not only are Christians more persecuted than any other faith group, but in ever-increasing numbers are experiencing the very worst forms of persecution. In fact, according to the U.S. State Department, Christians in more than 60 countries face persecution from their government simply for believing in Jesus Christ. Beatings, physical torture, confinement, isolation, rape, and even death. And that most of the persecution comes from authoritarian governments or other hostile religious groups. Nick Ripkin, in his book, The Insanity of God, he has this, in that book, he takes a journey and begins to meet with and learn about the persecuted church. And as he came across house church leaders in China, he he, uh, found a common scenario and language that our brothers and sisters are using in China whenever they are confronted by authorities The authorities show up and they say, if you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and throw you onto the streets. They reply, do you want my house and my farm? Well, you need to talk to Jesus because he owns this property. Well, we can't get to Jesus, but we can get to you and you and your family will have nowhere to live. Well, then we will be free to trust Jesus for shelter and daily bread. If you keep this up, we're going to beat you. Well, then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing. Well, we will throw you in prison. Well, there we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to captives 
and to set them free. We will be free to plant churches in prison. If you do that, we will kill you. Well, then we will be free to go to heaven and to be with Jesus forevermore. Beloved, here in the United States, the reality is, is we have freedoms that have not been experienced throughout the course of church history. They are unique to our place and time. And my point of talking about the persecuted church is not to give us guilt over our freedoms, but rather this quote from, again, that book, Nick Ripkin's Insanity with God, as he was dialoguing with the persecuted church, they charged him with this. Do not ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. Do not ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. And that is the boldness to be a witness for Jesus Christ. As I read this passage about the Holy Spirit falling and the ground shaking and they are filled with courage and boldness from the Holy Spirit. Beloved, when you read that, doesn't it give you a hunger, a thirst to say, do you think that God would do that here? Couldn't we use a shot of courage and boldness in our lives? Are we so easily giving up boldness and the, and the witness of Jesus Christ in our freedom while our brothers and sisters around the world are being persecuted and even dying to proclaim the name of Jesus? Spirit, fill us with your courage and your boldness so that we would live every one of our days to the glory of your name. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, as we read your word about the difficulties faced by the early church, it stirs us with a confidence about the utter importance to establish our priorities how Peter and John, uneducated fishermen, could stand before the Supreme Court and boldly proclaim the name of Jesus. Father, it forces us to say to you, would you come and take inventory in our lives? Help us to reprioritize so that we would never lose our witness. And Father, would you grant us courage so that we would be bold when our society tells us not to be bold, but to simply compromise for the sake of peace. Help us to remember that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And the courage to call our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members to life so that they could experience times of refreshment from you. God, may your spirit fall amongst us. May we be shaken and may the ground be shaken. May it be, may it be known throughout Bernie that your spirit and your presence is with us. That, Father, you would do what only you can do by reaching into the depths of men and women's hearts and and healing and calling to eternal life. Father, if there is anyone here this morning that has never placed their faith in you, I pray that right now, you would give them the faith and the courage 
to say yes to Jesus. We pray all of this in his holy name. Amen. Church family, the praise team comes up and leads us in one final song. And it is an opportunity for you and for I to, to respond in faith. To respond in faith, however the Lord has moved and spoken to you this morning. I can never tell you what that looks like, but I can charge you. If you have heard God's word, he should have spoken to you. And that always demands a response of obedience. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. I'll be down here. If, if you placed your faith in Jesus Christ during this service... Come and allow me to celebrate and to rejoice in you. If you need someone to pray with you to, to help you think through that and walk that out, I promise there is nothing greater in the whole world that we would love to walk with you and, and so that you could leave here today and you could have a confidence and assurance that you've been born again. Whatever the Spirit of God has placed upon you this morning, you be obedient.
Amen. Would you give God a hand clap of praise? If you're a guest, a visitor with us this morning, we're really honored and grateful that you are here. And we would want nothing more than to be able to make a connection with you. You know, it's a large church. Maybe you're here because your uh, kiddo's singing on stage, okay? Listen, there are cards in the pew rack in front of you. There's a guest card. If you would fill that out and take it to the connection tent, Miss Kathy is there. She actually has a gift for you, okay? Uh, and we wanna help you to be able to get plugged in and uh, uh, make it feel like this is a home because deep down in the end, right, this, this church family is a home. And so we wanna be able to connect with you. There's also a card that says if you have prayer requests, I promise a pastor would love to follow up with you this week. Okay, Uh, church, I'm gonna pray a prayer of blessing over you before we leave, but I need to remind you, this evening is really, really important. Okay, as Daniel said, at 4.30, Meadowlands Baptisms. By the way, if you don't know Meadowlands, it's a ministry partner of ours, it's in the community. It is is a home for uh, uh, children and teenagers who have been uh, removed from their home. Okay, and and they're not going back. They, They are in this system. And God has allowed us as a church to to go and to lead a Bible study weekly. And uh, these students, these children are getting saved. Praise God. Just just like a month ago, there were 11 being baptized. And and there are five that are being baptized this, uh, this afternoon at 430. Okay. But I told you that they've been removed from their home. So they don't have a family. And If they get baptized in an empty auditorium, that'd break my heart, okay? And so 4.30, Meadowlands Baptisms, we bumped it back to 4.30 because our night of prayer is tonight at five. And I wanna charge you. I want you to know we're gonna be spending intense time this evening praying for the persecuted church and praying for one another, okay? So if... If you, if you have loved ones in your life, if you have estranged children, if they need prayer for salvation, we're going to be intent on our faces together, seeking God doing this, okay? We show up on Sunday mornings, and we sing, and we pray together, and we listen to uh, a preached word, but it is completely different when we gather together extently for the purpose of praying together, okay? And as you see in the scripture These are the moments that God shows up in incredible ways. So please, if you can be here tonight at 5 o'clock, 4.30 for baptism and 5 o'clock for our night of prayer. Let me pray over you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work that you've done in our lives. Now, as we leave here, we want to leave and we want to be filled with your spirit and we want to walk in the courage and boldness that you're calling us to. God, to be a light and to shine your light. You are worthy Father, grant us, give us that courage to walk worthy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. See you tonight.